What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Healthspan Academy. I'm your host, Craig Shearart, and with me today is the one and only Marcus Philly, who is a huge figure in the fitness community. He started his academic career with a Bachelor of Science from the University of California, Berkeley, and then went on six years as owner of TJ's Gym slash CrossFit Mill Valley. He's been owner of Opex San Rafael since 2017. He's a four-time CrossFit Games athlete with a top finish of 12th fittest in the world in 2016. And most recently, he's been known for the owner uh, of Functional Bodybuilding. And that's kind of what we're going to chat about today, how Marcus uh, helps his clients get fit and, and healthy. Marcus, thanks very much for joining me, man. Yeah, my, my pleasure, Craig. I'm happy to uh, be on another podcast and get a chance to speak to a different audience. And so, we, so we, I always love to see where the conversations go. Sweet. Let's get into it then. So I want to kick this off with what athletics look like for you growing up. Obviously, you've got uh, some good some good genes in terms of the athletics. Was that something that was sort of thrust upon you in your household? You were able to kind of like feel out your sports, or what was the athletic kind of background like growing up? You know, I think I think both my parents probably did youth sports, but they didn't pursue athletics like at any high level, and mm-hmm. wasn't necessarily part of their like. You know, my dad played golf, and my mom you know, maybe tinkered around with some tennis, like in her, you know, as a, as a grown up. but they, my mom did like snow sports, like skiing, but so yeah. no sports were not like this big thing that were like, you do it. And everyone in the family does it. You have all these, mm. you know, I just kind of gravitated towards like physical activity. I loved, you know, I was pretty loved to play the sports. Like this is what interests me, whatever was going on, whatever was happening on the play yard. Yeah. Um, I remember like, they were like, you want to try this? I was like, sure. And I like, you know, eight, nine, 10 years old, showing up at Little League practice, knew nothing about baseball, but I was like, I just want to try something new, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, I remember like my first practice at Little League. I like, like, you're going to play first base. But I went and I like literally stood on the bag. I was like, <laughs> okay, this is, this is where I stand. Right. And they're like, eh, we're going to move you over yeah, a little yeah. bit. That's amazing. Um, but yeah, just like to play all, all the different things and, you know, I think soccer stuck, golf stuck, baseball uh, was kind of a, it was a, it was mildly sticky, but yeah. I had a bad experience with like a coach in high school. And I was like, oh, really? Fuck, forget that. Like this guy's a, this guy's a jerk and I yeah, don't want to, like, I don't want to do this. So I uh, played a lot of soccer, um, played a lot of golf. And then those uh, sort of just took me through college. Those were like my college sports, uh, cool. golf, not like, not in college. I played competitively outside of uh, school but played yeah. competitive college soccer and and then kind of found that like in college that just really the physical the physicality of sport and training for sport is what what i like the most i didn't actually right. like the i wasn't like a diehard competitor wanted to go and like you know rip people's faces off on the field and like i mean i was competitive when i would yeah. play but you know win or lose draw like I was just, I was really more in it for the process and, and the, and the physical and human emotions that went with the, uh, you know, the desire to be better and to, and to improve. And that's um, awesome. Yeah. So that, that, that became pretty clear to me in college when I was a bench warmer and I was like, huh, like I would much rather be trading right now than just sitting on the yeah, stairs. Like, this, <laughs> this sucks. Right. Right. In the pine. Yeah. It's kind of a similar story myself actually kind of like I got up towards university level and got some offers for for sports and stuff but I realized that I liked being in the gym better than baseball baseball mm-hmm. is my most competitive sport so it's just interesting how that works out and then uh, yeah yeah especially when you kind of do a mix and I feel like that's probably how you were sort of uh lended well to your crossfit career you kind of like this diverse background like the training so how did fitness kind of begin was that like similar story like you were using fitness to kind of train for your sports and then fitness became the sport or how did that kind of all pan out you know, I think I'm sure that the first like interest in training was to just build muscle and to like yeah. look more muscular and be mm-hmm. more be more jacked. Yeah. Um, I never had like uh, aspirations of getting huge. Like I just was like I want to go and build some muscle. Yeah. Um, so I started that in high school. You know, early on freshman sophomore year in high school, mm-hmm. and pretty much was like in the gym most. You know, most days when I didn't have a practice or something else going on, especially when I started to drive, I could drive myself. It was like, that was, that was my go-to place. Yeah. Was, was working out the school gym in the morning before, you know, class started with like the physics teacher, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, with like two other kids who would wake up at five o'clock that early in, in life. Um, yeah. So that, then I think, you know, there was some training 
in high school that was like, oh, this is good for my sport. Like this right. is helping me jump better. Yeah. I can do in sprints up these crazy steep hills by my school, you know, uh, just looking for ways to like challenge myself that didn't have a lot of, I didn't have a lot of like structure to it. It was just like, right. oh, this is hard. Let me go do that. Yeah. But then, yeah, then that, that training really um, got more refined in, in college. You know, right. I got some D1 strength conditioning coaching and, and, you know, pretty general programs. I mean, we, I was doing the same, many of the same lifting programs that the football team was doing, you know, right. position players. And so I was like, whatever, yeah. you know, we're all, we're all getting stronger, building our squats, power cleans, yeah. bench press, pull up, like, you know, can't, can't argue with that. And it certainly had, had a translation to what we were doing on the, on the field. Right. Um, yeah. So that was kind of like how things got ramped up for me. And I think it solidified in college that like, Hey, training is a, this is a thing I could dedicate time and energy to. Yeah, I feel you. And is that around the time that you, you found CrossFit? No, it was well before CrossFit. I mean, okay. uh, CrossFit was after college. It was like 20, probably 22, 23 when I found CrossFit. Yeah. You know, I started college as a 17 year old, which was funny. It's like at the student athlete uh, orientation for all the new incoming freshmen. Yeah. It's like telling us all these things. They're like, hey, anybody in the room not 18 need a parent to sign their waiver? And I was like, <laughs> me and two other kids in like a room of 300 kids. I was like, shit. Oh, man. Um, so, yeah, the um, CrossFit was, was a bit later. Um, yeah, when I, I got, I, was, I took a little gap, gap year, two years between college and medical school. And that was when, mm-hmm. you know, someone first, I got a first the first whiff of the name, you know, CrossFit, yeah. and I was uh, at the time. I remember somebody said that, and I was like, I was like, this poor guy, he doesn't, he obviously doesn't know that it's called, you know, called props training, not yeah. CrossFit. <laughs> he's got <laughs> the word. He did. Yeah. He's totally wrong. Yeah, <laughs> that's hilarious, amazing. And then uh, was CrossFit kind of how what led you into coaching? Were you doing a bit of coaching before that, or how did the coaching piece come yeah. together for you? Coaching was sort of like it started with um, mostly just being like a, a soccer coach and, and training mm. training kids in in my my position, which was goalkeeper. Right. So yeah. I, I, you know, I started coaching soccer pretty early. Um, even before I went to college, I was mm-hmm. like kind of uh, you know in the club in the club level. There were a lot of you know. A lot of kids in my area wanted extra coaching, wanted like specialty coaching. Yeah. And I had been coached by enough people to know enough, you know? And so, right. um, and then during college, I coached soccer. And then after college, I was coaching some soccer. I even came back and coached at my high school for a couple of years, a couple oh, wow. of seasons. Um, so I did a lot of that. So there was a combination of team, you know, coaching and individual coaching. Right. And like, drilling and working kids fitness to try and get them better for the sport then i started to coach if there was one kind of standout goalkeeper from my high school that was kind of like after my time i was back coaching and he was like well dude you're you're like strong like you know what it takes like how do i get ready for college i was like we got to get you in the weight room so yeah. started coaching him you know it was like one of my first clients um i was also coaching you know, a group of like my like former high school friends and my brother who's similar age. Yeah. Um, they were like, Hey, we want to get in shape too. And we would go down to the track and I would put them through, you know, variety of different calisthenics and, you know, different body weight things and some conditioning. And um, so I was always trying, you know, my hand at coaching, yeah. but I always kind of, I had such high regard and respect for the coaching craft mm. that, um, I was like, oh, I, you know, here I was studying to be a doctor and I'm like, I could go do that. But like yeah. to go be a trainer, like, well, that's, that's a big deal. Like, I don't yeah. even know if I could, I could step into that world. I, it's kind of funny how I like kind of Your place perception that on, changes. Like, yeah. my perception change. Yeah. yeah. Anyhow. Um, so yeah, I, I would say my first like real, you know, just like, I'm going to get in there and I'm going to coach fitness to people who are just like your everyday folks, not like friends and family was through CrossFit. Right. That was my first gig of like, but I came into it with, with a pretty massive amount of, of coaching and teaching experience, right. uh, coaching soccer, coaching individuals, coaching fitness and tutoring 
you know, a lot of students over the years in math and science, which mm -hmm. people might think like, that's not necessarily coaching, but it's like, well, when you coach individuals or you coach groups, there's a big component of trying to like, you got to educate and you have to mm -hmm. teach lessons. And that is not an easy thing. It takes years of practice to really yeah. learn mm -hmm. how to, how to formulate your thoughts and the, and the information in a way that's going to be received by yeah. the student. Yeah. And so that was always something that I think I carried into coaching that I never talk about much. I, did, I didn't play up a lot, but it was like a big part of my cool kit and my skill set as a coach. So yeah. I would say, you know, it's probably 10 years of coaching and educating before I ever stepped foot in a CrossFit gym. And people right. were like, wow, you're really good at this. And I was like, well, it's my first day, but. I have this other background and doing yeah, this yeah. other stuff, plus a lot of, you know, a lot of science and exercise, phys and nutrition, you know, yeah. personal education and, and academics uh, yeah. to kind of back it up. And you can kind of throw your own spin on things. I love that. Um, so I think like you kind of alluded to this, but like you, you first learn the communication is, I think the one piece when you start out as a coach, you just think it's automatic because you, you don't realize that not everyone learns the way that you do. You know, yeah. If you're like a tactile learner, you you teach that way, or you tend to like yeah. lean into that, or if it's like audio, aud like audible kind of cues, you you lean into that. Um, but uh, so I want to talk a little bit about how uh, the someone that's been coaching for this many years, and the industry's changed so much, and the fitness industry is kind of constantly evolving. You have like these little kind of uh, rifts, I guess, between the bodybuilding world, the CrossFit world over these years. Uh, talk a little bit about how your own kind of coaching philosophy has developed and 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 differs from the early days to into now. What are the biggest changes? Well, may, maybe one of the biggest changes that I feel now as a coach, and this is this is also connected to how my business has evolved too. Right. Getting into a gym, coaching in a in a brick and mortar facility, group classes with a sprinkle of like individual personal training that I was doing. Yeah. You know, these were people that were going to come to me and I was the solution. Mm -hmm. I had the full, like I was the place where they were going to come. They're I was going to tell them Marcus what to abs. do. They're going to come and I'm going to solve the problems for yeah. them in a way, you yeah. know? Um, and now, which, which I poured a lot of love and energy into, and I was mm -hmm. de so dedicated to the individual. I was like, I'm going to check up on you. I'm going to call you. I'm going to like, you know, and through the process of that as a coach, I was also developing myself as a, as an athlete right. in CrossFit as a sport. Yeah. And I had a coach that took a very different like approach with me, which was like, it's going to be, a, you know, I'm going to make, I'm going to make all my clients and all my athletes like, very autonomous like they just they're gonna go do it on their own i'm just mm -hmm. gonna give them just enough to guide them along the way they're gonna figure it out all on their own almost like teaching you to teach yourself in a way yeah yeah, yeah. like how do you teach somebody to learn fitness by doing it through doing it you know right. and it's rather tricky. than like have to super tricky yeah and i think i was really well suited for that style of of coaching because right. i was just i had been doing that for a decade more already or more already yeah you know i was self-taught like learning like a compiling information how do i make myself better how do i make you know it's one of my probably one of my gifts and one of my skills that i've had for two you know 20 years now to to apply to fitness but i also saw there's like a lot of value in that i was like well no matter how hard i try with so many customers you know it's a it's a leaky ship like they're mm. just people are churning out like yeah there's when they're so reliant on me to show up and again essentially it was like if if i was going to have to be everything for them the moment i didn't show up the moment i wasn't there they were going to suffer and they yeah. were going to lose consistency and 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 get off track mm -hmm. and so for me that just didn't feel like that felt like a losing battle yeah. in a way you know i could find you know my 50 perfect customers that were like super motivated and you know like disciplined and but then i wasn't teaching them anything anymore yeah. they were they were doing it you know so yeah. i don't know over time i think what i've tried to transition towards is i want to create a a system of training 
where we encourage people to learn, empower them with, you know, a good guide and resources. But at the end of the day, they have to show up and do it, you know, yeah. and like, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not the cheerleading type um, yeah. anymore. You know, maybe once upon a time I really was, yeah. but, and, and what's, what's hard gets about exhausting. It does get exhausting. Yeah. And what's also hard about that is if you start in the industry and you start that way, you build a lot of deep connections and relationships yeah. early on Very through true. that that level. And then right. people, that's what they remember you by. Yeah. That's so what they true. come to respect. And they're yeah. like, oh, it's the old days. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. I do too. But yeah. I go back to that. You know, I'm yeah. not that. Or they refer you somebody that needs that kind of love and attention. You're like, hey, yeah. I'm not can't do that. I don't do that anymore. I can't you know? scream my lungs out for eight hours a day, every day. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm not, you know, maybe I'm not. And maybe that's meant that I'm not the, I'm not the coach for the person who's right. just starting off the yeah. couch. Yeah. I'm, I'm the, I'm the coach for somebody who's got some experience, mm -hmm. who's tried a bunch of things. Yeah. Who knows they want fitness to be part of their life, but they've, they, they never had a coach like me step up or a program or an offer like me where I'm like, hey, I'm going to teach you how to do this for a long time. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to put it together in a way that if you, if you can just be, you know, consistent for six months, it's going to click and you're going to have tools for the rest of your life. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, that's not for everybody. Yeah. But those lights go off. That's a tricky thing to balance, especially depending on where they're at in that fitness journey. You kind of talked about that, like beginners kind of need their hand held and they need that push and that raw, raw. But if it's something that's online, you can't be there in person. It's probably not going to stick. And I wonder how many programs have been purchased and they're just still just sitting in the inbox and haven't, <laughs> haven't been picked up yet. Right. A lot. Yeah, which wild. is a whole other topic about business. It's like, okay, so I want to be the best coach and write the best programs and have the most client successes in the world. Yeah. I also want to run one of the most successful businesses and I can because a successful business isn't about me. It's about a, a group of people that the work results. In and yeah. all the people that it supports. Yeah. It's like be the best coach in the world that delivers the best product and the best results for people and then sell as many programs as possible. It's like, like you said, there's a lot of programs that get sold that don't, don't yield results for the individual because they yeah. don't use it. Yeah. And it's like, I don't want to, you know, I, I want to create solutions for people. And I also know that there's, you know, if we're selling online, like there's, there's people that aren't getting the full value from it, yeah. but you can't, you know, that's, that's part of the business too. Yeah. It's, it's gotta be a niche thing if you're going to make it work somehow. And as you obviously miss a big portion, but otherwise you're going to miss everybody. Um, so you kind of alluded to some of the principles I think that uh, led to the birth, so to speak of like functional bodybuilding. And I think what's interesting is that if you heard this like 10 years ago, that's like an oxymoron, right? It's like there's, there's functional fitness and then bodybuilding and bodybuilding is like all about aesthetics and, and you kind of manage to merge the two. And I feel like there's less kind of like the debates, there's less of the rivalries, I think, between them than there probably used to be. Um, but talk about how that principle kind of came, came to life and how you came up with that. Cool. I mean, it wasn't so much like a, a principle that I came up with as much as like, I, I had a need, I was trying to, uh, re like resolve that issue that I was having, which was, I was doing a lot of high intensity functional fitness CrossFit mm, yeah. um, on a competitive level, which yeah. is a different takes a different toll on the, on your physical body and, yeah. and nervous system. Um, and so in order to get out of that and to recover from it and to, and I suppose, heal myself, I needed to change the inputs, you know, the training stresses, and I needed yeah. to use training methods that just had, there was more controlled approaches to like intensity. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, when you start to control for variables, you start to add in rest periods, you start to use tempo in your weight training, mm -hmm. you start to look at, well, I could do a clean or I could just do some like, you know, isolated you know, pulling movements and mm -hmm. some isolated squats and some, yeah. um, rather than do muscle ups, I'm going to do strict dips. I might do some dumbbell bench pressing. Like you start to pull from different disciplines and yeah. those disciplines that the discipline in weight training that has the most, you know, control from my experience of coaching was like bodybuilding principles. It's like, if yeah. we just 
lift with time under tension. We focus on, you know, rep ranges and then we can really, we can really heal people. We can get them mm-hmm. strong, yeah. optimize their hormone function. We can do a lot of good stuff. And so that was what I needed at the time. So I started right. to use those tools to heal myself. Yeah. And when it became like, you know, I, I didn't, at the time I wasn't thinking like, this is like a, this is a pervasive problem. Like we need to deal with, it. I was just like, I got to fix my sh- yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, and yeah. then, you know, thanks to social media, there's kind of this instant feedback loop where mm-hmm. I could present, this is what I'm doing. And then, you know, tens, hundreds, thousands of people say, Hey, that looks incredible. Yeah. Love this. I love this interplay of like being able to do functional training yeah. with bodybuilding. Like yeah. ooh, I kind of like that, yeah. you know, I, how do I do that? Yeah. So my first iterations of functional bodybuilding were simply, you know, uh, my training program sort of rewritten in a way that I thought could really uh, work for a larger group of people, you know, so right. take out the highly complex skills or weights that I was using mm-hmm. more generic general for the for the general population yeah. and put that out to the world and see how how it would go. And yeah. that was this is how I was coaching my individual clients. And so I wrote a, I wrote a functional bodybuilding group program and, you know, it, it had some success. It was like, okay, we'll do it again. We'll do it again. We'll do it again. Okay. Two years later, this thing is pretty real and this is really helping a lot of people. So we're going to, we're going to stick to it. And yeah. now I want to start exploring more deeply what it means to do, not just like CrossFit with a touch of bodybuilding, but like how to do bodybuilding with a touch of CrossFit. What is right. that? Yeah. You know, how do we, yeah. How do we bias different different approaches? I love that. Very cool. Um, and I love, I think you're starting to see some of that stuff creep in, maybe not the competitive level of CrossFit, but at least the affiliates, they're starting to like yes. catch up on the value of isometric training and eccentrics and those those tempo lifts, um, yeah. pa- pause reps and that kind of stuff. Cause it's great for control and stability and rehab and uh, developing position. It's just not like the sexy thing you'll see at the games. Like they're not doing sure. pa- yeah, pause yeah. front squats for or, uh, no. or, or eccentrics, no. you know, um, but, um, I love that. So I feel like the lines are starting to get blurred. I think a little bit between what bodybuilding functional fitness and then functional bodybuilding. Do you, do you have those kind of defined within your program? What, where, how far you can kind of stretch your core programming before it's, it's outside of the scope of what you're doing or like, is that, are there hard rules or kind of like soft, just kind of principles? Um, no, they're, they're not hard rules. You know I mean? I think when when you get so we have clients that come to us and work with us uh that want individual coaching you know mm-hmm. and it, coaching ends up looking like you know we sort of take the general principles of what functional bodybuilding is mm-hmm. and then we specialize based upon what they need mm-hmm. so somebody somebody's really interested in crossfit competitively or sport crossfit but they resonate with our training philosophies then that person might be doing you know like skilled gymnastics training and on yeah. three times a week that look mm-hmm. like CrossFit wads and yeah. Olympic thing. And, you know, and they, they have in their off season, they might do a lot more true FBB or bodybuilding. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. And we just blend those and right. periodize it for their goals. Um, I think the other, you know, we, we will get some people that are very interested in physique work and they mm-hmm. really want to change their body composition. So we dial back a lot of like the mixed conditioning work and aerobic work that we might do for right. some looking for a, a well-balanced functional bodybuilding program. Mm-hmm. Um, now, with that said, like what we're what's happening year after year is that the middle of functional bodybuilding is starting to get pretty clearly defined. Like right. this is what it's like. Mm-hmm. And you know. Do we get people that still want stuff on the outside? Sure, but yeah. we're sort of clear. Like our target audience wants to come in and you know lift weights safely mm-hmm. with like actual hypertrophy efficacy. Like right. they they want to feel like they're this is making them more muscular or yeah. look better. Yeah, and they want to do some conditioning that is like. A little bit of high intensity conditioning that because it's fun mm-hmm. 
because it pushes them in a way that they might not otherwise know how to push themselves. Like you can push yourself with, with bodybuilding, weight training very, very intensely. True. But there's not a lot of people that know how to dig that deep. Yeah. They can get there a lot faster with like a, you know, a CrossFit style workout. Mm -hmm. Just that on top of everything I've, I've mentioned that they want, they want to be safe and they want right. to like, they don't want to get beat up and, and, and have to si sideline themselves for months yeah. because they tried to do snatch muscle up and they had no business doing that. Yeah. I think it's, it's an, it's an interesting playground to work with when you're doing remotely too, because you don't have that pressure of who's working out next in the gym. That's like pumping out butterfly pull-ups and like, Oh, well, I need to do that. You kind of like more work at your own pace and there's less pressures and that kind of stuff. And I think that lends pretty well to someone that's most interested in kind of the longevity piece. And mm -hmm. that's something I want to dive into a little bit because you kind of alluded to that, that you want to program that people can do long-term, which is basically the scope of the, the podcast, trying to get people to <laughs> improve their health span. Um, and I think a lot of what um, the elements that I've kind of seen in the programming uh, are key. I think like the the bilateral versus unilateral uh, temp the tempo stuff, the you know two bit of isometrics, time domain um, pieces. Talk a little bit about what elements you think are essential for someone that's like looking to do to to basically improve not just their lifespan but their health span as long as they're functional and kind of like longevity. Like, what are the key pieces that you find essential for, for a program like that? Yeah, I mean, I would. It's. Are you familiar? You're familiar with Ben Patrick and and oh the, yeah. The yeah, system. yeah, yeah. So, I would basically say it's like what Ben is doing with, um, with a with gear geared towards, you know, so the so it's like get people capable to do the skills like those those kind of foundational or or level one you know skills that he teaches mm -hmm. like check the boxes that you can perform these basic movements um pain free mm -hmm. so that's accomplished this is like checking the box for range of motion and right. mobility yeah um then it's like we need to build some you know appreciable strength in these areas so you have mm -hmm. to put this resistance that is like hard for you right. every week for the rest of your life yeah and that you know that perceived effort you know will change over time but you have to basically so you got to get safe in movement mm -hmm. so that you can push yourself hard enough safely right and then on top of that there needs to be um like a layer of aerobic fitness that is that is that you tackle week after week like mm -hmm. you do it two to three times a week where you're pushing your aerobic system and you're building cardiorespiratory endurance and you know maybe aerobic power and like that zone two to zone three work yeah has to be touched yeah and you can touch that with weights you can touch that with like you know the type of training like the type of conditioning work that we do and yeah you can push and pull a sled that can get you there and mm -hmm. you can ride a stationary bike you can hike a mountain but yeah you can get there with sport possibilities yeah. around this yeah yeah but you know when it comes to sports and it comes to like doing like oh i get my walks in like i just find that people are just not measurable there's not not enough consistency and there's way too much room mm -hmm. over time for those things those variables to change you don't have something measurable so it's like yeah i'm, I'm not for like using physical activity and 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 sport to define what those training metrics need to be for long-term health mm. it's like well you train this is how much you train this is what you need to do you need to check mobility and movement boxes you need to check mm. resistance boxes you need yeah. to check aerobic fitness boxes get those done in the gym in a controlled way and then go use your health you know your fitness in whatever you love to do right yeah. um there are not you know in, in the 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 large scope of people on the planet, at least in Western culture, like the number of people who do an effective job of like, well, oh, I play soccer three times a week and that's my fitness Yeah, and doing it for 20 years. Like the number is almost zero. Yeah. So the true. people I find that do that well are like the surfers who like are just connected to the ocean and they're yeah. in the like five days a week and they've done it. They live on the beach and they've done it for their whole life. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah you're like, you're one of, you know, you're a, you're a snowflake. Like nobody does that. 
you know, who lives in like the the concrete jungle of like New York City. Like, yeah, yeah. you got you got to schedule this stuff yeah. out. Yeah, so true. Uh, I love that. And I I I think that that definitely the op- possibilities are endless. I think for what your fitness could look like. I think, but the one piece I think that gets missed, if, especially people that are left to their own devices, is like the power and speed element. I think like people just rarely are going to push themselves without presence of a coach and and if no. you see that in older age that fast switch yeah. fibers really kind of decline um what are the the sort of elements you you recommend or, or program most to kind of develop those fast switch fibers and, and develop strength speed and power i gotta be honest i don't really think it's i don't really think it's that important for for longevity hmm. you know i mean somebody might disagree with me that there needs to be some level of athleticism that you can like you know but i think if we have strong individuals people that train their cp system they like lift weights and they're mobile they're gonna be fine like uh, you know my dad doesn't need to do anything explosive you know he doesn't jump and produce a lot of power like if he wants to for his golf game like if that matters to him sure we can train it but it's like Mm -hmm. if he's strong and he can squat well and he can deadlift and he can you know, perform a Patrick step up with pain free and, you know, do a split squat and like, he's totally good. You know, yeah. he doesn't need to jump on a box. He doesn't need to do a power clean. Could he do some like, maybe like the Russian kettlebell swing would be like maybe something that could teach him some, some, some speed and some power. But mm-hmm. outside of that, like, I just don't, I don't see it. Now, something that would be safe would be like sprints on a bike. That to me would make sense. Like yeah. I'll get to do, but that I'm not doing to develop power as much as I'm like, you know, maybe using it to like do just a touch of lactic training. Yeah. Maybe like optimize hormones if, you know, but it's got to sure. be done really thoughtfully, sure. you know, and, and just yeah. to remind him that like he's capable of of something hard. Yeah. Right. More like the, the, the approach to high intensity or power or speed work is just a reminder, like, well, I'm capable of these things for many mm-hmm. people because it, outside of like, there's no application of not very few applications of speed and power, um, especially, you know, as you get much older. Now, if you have that ingrained in your life from early on and you learn to power clean and power snatch and, you know, do plyometrics and you want to keep that up and you just do it for your life, like, you know, you play like Ben plays basketball and wants to dunk and yeah. do that. Like, okay. That makes sense. But you know, there's, there's not a, I don't think there's a, a need for that gen pop going long-term. Yeah. I think I agree. I think it's, it's pretty low on, on the priority list. It just depends what options you want open to you kind of when you get into your quote unquote retirement years. Right. So. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which, which is great. It's like, what do people want to do? They want to yeah. like travel, maybe, you know, maybe go on like a hike, walk around Rome for a day. Like, uh, yeah. you know, if they like, I want to, I want to be able to water ski. Like when I'm done, I want to be able to snow ski. It's like, then just have strong ass legs and ski. Like yeah. you'll get pl- plenty of training, you know, by just doing the thing you love every year. You know, yeah. I, um, but there might be somebody who's like, Hey, in my retirement, I want to like, you know, be balling, you know, every day, like, yeah, and, and, play you know four games of pickup and be able to dunk on like younger kids like yeah. okay let's keep you jumping <laughs> yeah for sure uh so i think the the most common modality comes to mind when we think strength and speed and power is olympic lift so is that is that how often is that programmed in one of your programs is that just people are asking for it you'll kind of you pre- prescribe it or where, where are your thoughts on a typical like the traditional kind of barbell olympic lifts we have um i mean plenty of our individual clients like that and we'll, yeah. we'll program olympic lifts um my of, of our group programs that we offer there's only one that has barbell olympic lifts in it and it's mm. you know it's low it's it's a low priority mm-hmm. you know depending on the time of year we'll touch it one day a week you know for a 10 minute imam uh for more of like skill acquisition right. yeah uh, or skill development but um, it's, it's low priority. It's not, yeah. uh, we don't, I'm not prescribing max effort, you know, on those very, very often at all. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, I, I personally don't, I mean, I'll do power cleans here and there. 
I might go through a little phase where I'll do like snatches once or twice, you know, once a week for maybe a month or two. Yeah. Uh, but it's not an area that I'm personally trying to develop. Now we have coaches on our staff who love it and mm. they have clients that they coach on that a lot. And yeah. so it's available. Uh, but I don't, I don't see a lot of people asking, you know, for more and more and more Olympic lifts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a tricky thing. Cause it's just like, yeah, it develops so many components of fitness. And I find it to be a good kind of longevity tool because it is coordination and speed and agility and all those kind of those miscellaneous kind of elements, but it takes the patience to get enough skill and mobility to be good at them and then trust that your clients can kind of follow it. So it's, I've, I've debated taking it out of my, my gym programming a few times, but I feel like the, the, the benefits still outweigh the risks, uh, I think in terms of like what, what we're doing, but, um, but yeah. you, the way you said that, it makes sense. Like the benefits outweigh the risks. If somebody is willing to put in the time and, yeah. the, and the patience yeah. to learn yeah. and I just don't see that, like, unfortunately the level of commitment people have or the time that they allocate towards their fitness is still very small yeah it's it's too small yeah i i would hope that sometime in our lifetime we will see that the sh there's a shift in priority in people's lives like society wide to say hey we need to be allocating two plus hours a day to movement yeah, yeah. in which case then you know, we can really start to have that conversation. But now people are like, how do I get my movement down to 40 minutes a week, three <laughs> yeah. times, 40 minutes, yeah. three times a week? Yeah. I got time for 10 minute workouts. Go. You know, and yeah, yeah and that is, that's, that's the majority of people yeah, out there. I know. It's people wild. who are training 90 minutes to two hours a day is a tiny fraction of the people on this planet it's and this so true. Western culture. So, well, the majority is probably doing nothing at all. <laughs> They're sitting on the couch. Exactly. The majority of people yeah. working out. Yeah. Are well, Olympic that. lifting, sure. you know, if we're talking about a big picture fitness and health span, it makes no sense to, to use that as a tool because the, the time allotment to learn that skill, like I could, I could check the box of aerobic fitness and strength much, much better with other tools that are lower, that, lower that skill yeah lower skill and then yeah. therefore lower risk to an to an, an, an individual but it's not to say like you know learning olympic lifting isn't some isn't it doesn't have value it's massively valuable yeah. i'm so yeah. fortunate i feel so fortunate and grateful to have learned the olympic lifts because mm -hmm. i could you know what i want to go snatch today and i can yeah. do that and i can yeah. do it in a way where i get great strength mm -hmm. development coordination i could yeah. do it aerobic fitness out of it like i could i can go do that and yeah. i wouldn't have you know if i was just training today and like this is all the time i had to train because i was you know had two kids in a in a business like i might not start with olympic lifting because it's right. just a, be a pretty steep hill to climb yeah yeah it's such an interesting debate i remember chatting with greg everett uh about this and i was like is there is there a prereq to pre to, to weightlifting and he's like yes you have to want to weightlift because <laughs> it's like it's it's people don't underestimate that right it's definitely a, a yeah. curve and it's a great piece if you once you develop the scale and mobility for it but there's just a big road to get there um right and 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 sorry just we can move on after this but yeah sure think about how many people over the years that we've coached in our gyms and our facilities programs who just came because they wanted to get in shape yeah and told them that they should olympic lift because that's the best way mm. They didn't want to do it. They didn't ask to do it. They just yeah. we told them it was like that was that was where the choice was made for somebody, and it was right. really wrong. Yeah, yeah. That's all I you know. Anyhow. Yeah. No, I fully agree. Um, cool. Let's talk about that mobility piece you talked about. Um, and I think you basically in a roundabout way used my description of mobility, which is controlled range of motion over your whole spectrum. And you talked about Ben Patrick. I know he uses a lot of like. I don't know if you call them controlled articular rotations, but some version of that pale mm -hmm. rail, those kind of pieces to to develop um, the full control, the full range to be able to stability and kind of prehab joints um, and whatnot. What is, do you typically kind of add this as a, as a side piece? Is this built into your core programs or how much do you recommend people add mobility kind of routines into the day? Or is that kind of mix match within the rest of the programming? For us, it's definitely mixed into the programming. It's like yeah. part, of, it's part of the, the culture of our, programs it's mm -hmm. like we're we're using we're using resistance training as a way to enhance mobility not to 
lose mobility. Right. So yeah. that that's an education point that has to be, you know, reiterated over and over and over again with our customers. It's like, yeah. hey, like don't add weight here if you're compromising range of motion or technique tempo, yeah. Yeah. and and assign rep ranges. Like let's yeah. not do that. Yeah. Um now there are specific parts of the training session that have a very low ego, you know, attachment to it. It's like we're just doing a pre-fatigue or, you know, a a warm up and we have active range of motion movements in there, warm up, you yeah. know, mobility and stability movements in there. And so that is like reiterated too. It's like this is the place to really slow down and work on your work on your stiff bits. Yeah. And people take advantage of that. Um You're but yeah, I don't, I don't yeah. <laughs> I don't see it as like I again it's like should it be an additional thing that people do? Yes, it should be. Mm -hmm. Is it realistic in most people's life? Not yeah. even, not even close. So another 10 minutes of my day. <laughs> I can't, I seriously, kind of time. Like yeah. Hey, I need you to spend 30 minutes on uh Olympic lifting skill work each day. I also need you to do 30 minutes of mobility each day. Yeah. And then we're going yeah. to take another 45 to 60 minutes to do your resistance training and aerobic work. So <laughs> All right, I got 10 minutes total. How do we do this? Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's wild. Um, so yeah, it sounds like you're doing a mix of stuff. I want to get an idea of where your kind of per personal kind of priorities around your health and, and fitness lie. I think as a coach, you kind of have that constant mad scientist hat on where you're testing things out on yourself and it's easy to kind of get pulled in 10 different directions. Uh, what are your what's at the top of the list of your health and, and fitness priorities these days? And what do your habits look like around that, Marcus? Yeah, to me it's what um what about my day or how can i structure my day to feel like i've uh minimize anxiety hmm. maximize my attention and mental Focus, focus free yeah. and also maximize my presence in relationships to other people. Mm -hmm. So there's plenty of rabbit holes that I would love to go down on a fitness and health, you know, and I've done a lot of them in the past couple of years. Yeah. Some of them require a lot of mental energy. Yeah. Some of them require a lot of time. Mm -hmm. Some of them you know, they just add hours to the day. Yeah. When I do those things, I feel some of the physical benefit, but then the 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 mental um and emotional drawbacks to them start to weigh much heavier than the physical yeah, are, yeah. benefits. Yeah. So it's like I wanna I want a sauna every day for 30 minutes, 60 minutes, and cold plunge for five minutes, and do a walk, you know, walk 10,000 steps. Yeah. And I want to do all that. And I want a hot tub in the evening with my wife before we go to bed. Just that alone, what I just listed is three hours of stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. It's how it's 10, a, steps, it's 90 minutes. Yeah. And, true. and so, okay, well, if I took 90 minutes to do that, that's 90 minutes that I wasn't with my kids. Yeah. They're not walking with me right now. Yeah. yeah I'm not yeah. them in the stroller anymore. That's out. Yeah. You know, and I can't just up and leave the house while I'm supposed to be watching them. You know, and um, so this is just time of life. Like, if I want to get my sauna in every day, I got to get that in before everyone wakes up. Yeah. But if I get up and I sauna and I do all that, and then I'm with my kids, and then I don't touch work until nine thirty after I drop them off. Yeah, that's tough. I'm pretty stressed out. I'm anxious. Yeah. I'm, and I got a lot to do today. Yeah. And then I, my brain is shut off, and I'm right. I'm not listening to anybody. So when my yeah. wife texts, I don't respond to her text message because I'm so focused on this thing. So. <laughs> These are trade-offs that I just have. That's, a kiss, of, that's a kiss of death in my relationship. When her messages start to get to 10 and 12, there hasn't been a single yeah, reply. That's not, yeah. yeah, I mean, that's just a sign that something's wrong with yeah. me. Yeah, it's not nothing sure. wrong with her. She's yeah, not like overly, right. you know, yeah. needing it. Yeah. So these are the trade-offs that I'm becoming more and more aware of just with different, you know, as different phases of life are happening. Mm -hmm. And when people talk about like, you know, as I age, like all these things change in my body. It's like, nope, like your body's the same. Mm -hmm. Your your allocation of your time to different things 
has changed dramatically. Yeah. You know, like, so I can't be as active as I want, I, I might want to be. So I have to be aware that like, I can't eat as much as I used to eat yeah. as like a high level athlete, you know, yeah. hey, I'm, I'm doing all these self care things to improve my like, hormone function and my mental, sure. mental state and blah, blah, blah. But when I go in the sauna every day, and I do this thing, and I have this routine that takes 90 minutes, and I don't like address my inbox, then it's like negative yeah, no totally because i'm now stressed out about this other thing yeah uh, so i didn't give you like a clear answer what am i doing today i'm just the, the the general answer is i'm just paying really close attention to the the rewards or the the trade-offs that happen right. engaging in health improving behaviors mm -hmm. yeah hey sauna every day sunlight go ground yourself go eat these meals, go cook all these meals, go yeah. do all these things like yeah. meditate, read a book, get outside in nature. Like, okay, cool. I, that was five hours of my day. That was awesome. <laughs> and now it's Monday and I can't do that. Yeah. Like, so what true. are, what am I going to do today? So yeah. I'm eating really well, but I'm eating super simple because I can make mm. my meals for the whole day yeah. in under 45 minutes, probably closer to 30 minutes. And I'm like, good. I have That's all my amazing. food. And I fix that before I go to bed and yeah. then waking up and I'm going right to work thinking and I don't, I don't do anything except for, you know, work kids until like noon. And then I'll exercise for 60 to 90 minutes. Yeah. And then boom, I'm four days of training in the gym, two days of mountain biking, one day of just nothing and going yeah. for a walk and minimal. That's a rest day. Um, if I can sneak in a hot tub or if I can sneak in a sauna, awesome. If it ha doesn't happen, who cares? Yeah. Like I would love yeah. it, but it's not working right now. So yeah. this, this is like my day to day. And, you know, it's very different than it was six months ago. Mm -hmm. I'm doing a lot less, but I'm feeling much less stressed out. Yeah. I feel you. you really do have to kind of pick your, pick your spots. And it's just like, man, especially when you're trying to make a presence felt on social media, man, I should show myself in the sun and all this other crap. And yeah, it's right. wild, but it's just not realistic. It's life, life happens. Um, so talk to me a little bit about what you guys have going on with functional bodybuilding type of programs you guys are offering and, uh, and what people can expect from, from what you guys do. Yeah. Functional bodybuilding is kind of, uh, is the name of the business, but it's also yeah. just the home mm -hmm. of what I think I have to find in the space is functional bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. And place for people to go and experience that is, you know, through our group program. Um, so we offer a functional bodybuilding group subscription. You join it, you get four different training, you know, tracks that you can follow. Right. Um, minimalist people for people that want more of the CrossFit stuff, people that want more of the bodybuilding stuff, people that are kind of new to FBB and want something that's really straightforward and mm -hmm. easy to digest. It's all there. That subscription is called Persist. Awesome. Uh, and we have a, you know, we have an, an email list that we encourage everybody to get on right away. They get free training. They get, you know, weekly, we're putting out lots of good resources on training nutrition. This has been something that we've done for close to six years now. And wow. there's been, you know, there hasn't been a week that has gone by in six years where we haven't delivered something of value from like a, you know, a nutrition article to a training article, to a lifestyle, to a, you know, a, a training program, free, for, uh, you know, lots of resources that are just helping people. So that's, that's amazing. something that I really like people to go and, and check out. Cool. And uh, yeah, outside of that, we've, we've just been continuing to sort of expand to different social media platforms and make sure we're reaching as many people as we can. Awesome. Appreciate it. What's the best place for people to link up with your content on Instagram, uh, the website? What's Either yeah, I would, go, I would go jump on the email list. So that's uh, functional-bodybuilding.com forward slash free. Um, yeah, that's where I would head. Awesome. Well, I appreciate the time, Marcus. It's been an amazing chat. Much appreciated. Yeah, my pleasure, Greg. Thanks so much for having me. Cheers. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in this episode of Healthspan Academy. And we'll see you next time. Hey, what's up, guys? Thanks for tuning in today. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Thank you so much for supporting this channel. This has been a fun project. We are growing in viewership every single week, and we obviously couldn't do that without you. So thank you for continuing to tune in. I really hope you're getting value out of the, the programming and the content. Just wanted to give you a heads up.
I've been working on a, a book on health and longevity the last couple of years, been collaborating with my colleague, Dr. Dan Vitale, who's uh, an expert in the field as well. And we, we've basically just kind of summarized the literature, some of the techniques that we found really useful in the world of biohacking, what our exercise regimen looks like, what's, you know, cardio type stuff is going to help us live longer and healthier, a mobility work, nutrition. We've covered the whole spectrum, everything that you can basically be in control of in your health and fitness kind of moving forward to help you live as healthily as possible for as long as possible. And it's available free for download. So if you click on the YouTube banner, you'll see a link to download the, the blueprint. It's also on our Instagram profile or on the website. You can click on fivepillarmethod.com slash optimize to get your free copy of the book. And I hope you enjoy it. Hope you're keeping well. Thanks again for tuning in and we'll see you next time.